Good, Good morning, morning, ladies, ladies and, and gentlemen. gentlemen. Welcome back to day two of our virtual international conference on biodiversity and biotechnology for food security and sustainability. It's a pleasure to rejoin you as your masters of ceremonies. Today, we continue our journey of knowledge sharing, networking, and collaborative discovery. We have an exciting lineup of speakers, presentations, and discussion waiting for us, which will add to our insight and knowledge. Reminder to all of the participants, don't forget to fill in your attendance list provided by the committee on the comment box. Thank you. We will now have a special segment where we broadcast messages from our sponsors. Their support has been crucial in making this event possible. And we are grateful for their partnership. Let's take a moment to watch and appreciate their contributions. Nucleus is specifically recorded and visualized on a diagram. Plants with a higher ploidy level have more DNA and therefore emit a brighter fluorescence signal. Staining with UV light and DAP is very stable, not harmful for the user and more economical compared to other staining procedures. Therefore, the ploidy level can be easily determined using the Sysmex staining reagents and dedicated instruments. huge thank is given to our sponsorships Yayasan Dharma Setia Budi, PT Elokarsa Utama, and PT Sawita Interperkasa for ensuring these events are smooth and successful. To all participants, for the next agenda is plenary session two, but we need some break until 9.20. And kindly reminder to all the participants, please fill in the attendance list providing by the committee on common box because the certificate will be given if you come this two days event. And also a reminder, the seminar book has been provided by the committee and can be downloaded via the link sent through the comment box. Thank you. Moving forward, we are excited to present Plenary Session 2, featuring three distinguished speakers, Professor Suseno, Dr. Abdullah Bilal, and Dr. Wan Abdul Al-Qadar Imad Wan Mohtar. This session will be moderated by Kevin Muhammad Lukman, PhD. Kevin Muhammad Lukman, PhD, has expertise in environmental studies, blue carbon, mangrove, and waste management. For all the participants, to make our virtual gathering more personal and connected, we'd love to see your faces. If you're comfortable, please turn on your cameras. Don't worry about your background or any noise. We're all here to connect and learn together. Your presence makes this event special. For plenary session two, please welcome Kevin Muhammad Lukman, PhD. The time is yours.
Good morning, everyone. Welcome back to the virtual international conference, day two. And now we are entering our second plenary session. And we are very honored today because we have several distinguished speakers from all over the world. And before we start our plenary session, allow me to introduce the honorable speakers for this session. First, we have now with us online, offline here from uh, Indonesia, Bandung, Professor Dr. Suseno Amin. Thank you for coming today, Professor. Professor Suseno was graduated from the Department of Applied Molecular Biology, Faculty of Biology, Hamburg, University of Hamburg, as a doctoral. And now, Professor Suseno is working in the Plant Breeding and Seed Technology Laboratory in the Department of Crop Science, Faculty of Agriculture, Graduate School, Universitas Pajajaran. Professor Suseno has many prominent and also a very interesting publications. For example, in his latest research, there is the title with induction ploidy level on three progesterone. And the other publication, for example, in the early selection of drought stress tolerance in potato genotypes using polyethylene glycol. And another publication related with the, the effect of shoot explant types of 11 stevia accessions on in vitro growth. Again, thank you for coming as professor. And now we also have other speakers from international. Uh, Dr. Abdullah Bilal, are you here with us today? <laughs> Thank you for coming, Dr. Bilal. I know this is very early morning, I believe, now in Turkey, yes? <laughs> Yes, thank you. Thank you very much for coming with us today. And allow me to introduce uh, your profile first before we start our plenary session. Dr. Abdullah Bilal is a faculty member from Yildiz State University in the Chemical Engineering Department in Istanbul. Dr. Bilal has many experience as a researcher, for example, as a visiting researcher in University of Bora, Sweden and a visiting researcher in the University of Stavanger, Norway, and as a research associate as well. In addition, Dr. Bilal has also involved in many projects and publications. For example, in the projects as a researcher for the investigation of thermal and physical properties for construction days containing different boron chemicals and select as well as in the project of sustainable biofuel production from wasted rice via two-step fermentation. In addition, Dr. Bilal has also been receiving many honors, awards, and memberships. For example, as an international postdoctoral research fellowship program in 2023 by the Scientific and Technological Research Council of Turkey, as well as an awards from the European Cooperation in Science and Technology Action Working Groups by the uh, COST. So again, thank you, Dr. Bilal, for coming with us today. And now we also have our third speakers here with us today, Dr. Wan Abd Al Qadir Imad Wan Mohtar. Are you connected with us now? Thank you and good day uh, to you in Malaysia, I believe. Yeah. <laughs> and, and allow me to introduce your profile as well, Dr. Wan. So here with us today, Dr. Wan, is a faculty member and a senior lecturer from the Institute of Biological Science, Faculty of Science, University Malaya. His area of expertise including fungal biotechnology, food biotechnology, 
Microremediation and Bioreactor Designs. Dr. Wan has many interesting publications. For example, in his latest research, he was studied about the genodiesel, a new biodiesel feedstock from biomass of the mushroom Ganoderma ludicidum, as well as a research in the field of the enhancing biomass production of Lignosus rhinoceros in a high-scale steer tank bioreactor and its potential lipid as bioenergy. Dr. Wan here has received so many, a lot of the fundings and also projects. For example, in the 2022 to 2024, Dr. Wan received the private funding advanced landless biodiesel from oleogenous microorganism biomass as a principal investigator, as well as in 2021 to 2023, Dr. Wan involved in the international funding multiple criteria decision analysis for assessment of human capital development in the sustainable energy sector. Once again, Dr. Wan, thank you very much for coming with us and joining with us in this conference. Now, we will enter the plenary session and before we start, I would like to explain some of the rules. So each of the presenters will have about 15 minutes for presentation. And then we will start from Professor Suseno, followed by Dr. Bilal, and by, uh, the next is by Dr. Wan. And after all of the presenters have presented their materials, then we will enter the Q&A section. And for the uh, participants, feel free to put your question in the chat box and then uh, we can discuss it later. Thank you. Professor Susena, now time is yours. Thank you, good morning. I would like to say, uh, say thank you to organizer and uh, dean of uh, Graduate School Universitas Pajajaran for this uh, <coughs> chance. And today I will present and some of uh, our a result uh, of our research and then uh, later on we can discuss about this uh, uh, title genetic engineering of apomixid plan for food security and uh, sustainability in case in maize so we realize that the population now uh, this time this is uh, i put this um, uh, web address and you can all of you can uh, look the number of uh, uh, population in the world uh, in recent time. So it's uh, so now around more than eight. The micro. Hello, test, test. So please check the. It's okay. Can you hear me? Okay, thank you. So uh, today is the population around uh, eight, yeah, eight billion uh, people. So it is uh, day by day increasing uh, rapidly. So that's why it is the challenge for us, uh, especially for plant breeder and agronomists, and also the uh, some colleague scientists uh, to. Uh, get uh, more food than uh, what we have now. So we can look here that in the Food Security and Nutrition the World Report uh, 2022, that 29.6% of the global population, around 2.4 billion people, were moderately or severely food insecure in 2022 of which about 900 million, around 11.3% of people worldwide were separately food insecure. So it is the really a big challenge for the plant breeder and also the agronomist how to feed the world. So there is some uh, research in the... So now we have uh, committed to 2030 that 
no hunger anymore in the world. But I think in the uh, uh, next seven years, we hope, yeah, we hope this uh, commitment uh, can can be achieved. So, in the SDGs, in the SDGs, we can look here that no hunger, number two, and also no poverty, and of course, it is the climate action and uh, live on land. It is the some challenge that we have to uh, uh, be aware that uh, the SDGs goal have to be achieved. In this slide, so the plan reader um, plan is a biological biological machine for food production because this plan as uh, we can use as a, a fabric or machine to produce all uh, food what we need but the challenge is of course the climate change and then uh, conservation of uh, land and plant and we know that uh, abiotic stress like uh, light heat cool drug salinity and heavy metal this is always uh, uh, happen in our uh, cultivation uh, of plants so that's why we have to be aware that the plan we have to be maximized or the plan reader the plan reader have to make a program how to uh, improve the plan with uh, optimum, uh, optimum capacity. So, at last decade, but uh, the plan as hybrid, hybrid uh, plan, it is always um, get a result that the food, providing food, it is uh, still not enough. So, that's why the idea was how to uh, apply apomixis not in the uh, staple food like uh, rice and uh, mice because the apomixis is um, before is not on the uh, food but uh, have found it in several plants like uh, fruit and other plants. So it is just a short review sexual cycle of gymnosperm and sexual cycle of angiosperm. In this picture, I would like to show you that uh, the important thing from the plant and go to the product. The product has yield or component yield, like uh, seed and also from corn and rice. But the important in the step of uh, fertilization it is important for this both of uh, gymnosperm and angiosperm. So the seed production is depend on, on the uh, organelle or component in the embryo sac. So the embryo sac is provided uh, or mediated uh, male gamete to produce a seed. And in the next slide, the apomixis plant, this is not like other plant. In apomixis plant, in the second layer, F2, F3, or 4 apomixis plant, this is uh, the same uh, to one generation F2, generation F2, F3, and etc. But in sexual reproduction, if you use hybrid and they uh, plan again in the next generation uh, we can get the result but it's, it's uh, fluctuated so that's mean the reducing of yield or component of yield it is a um, uh, little bit uh, so not more than apomixis so that's why the idea is how to make apomixis in the uh, food plant or like uh, mice or rice 
or other plan. So in this slide, I work with the mice and isolate the egg cell from the uh, kernel of uh, maize. So uh, 1,012 genes have been isolated and in deep analysis we found the GI mice embryo sac family and then uh, in more detail I, I analyzed the GME as far for the engineered the apomexis. So, in this case, that this gene, that MES4 structure, we have completed the structure from the promoter and untranslated region and also open reading frame and then uh, stop um, uh, swans. So, actually, we have some candidate from other uh, gene that can be can be applied for engineer uh, like uh, media. Media or MEA is a gene associated with seed development and has been studied in the context of apomixis. And then second is DELA protein involved in regulating flowering and seed development and may play a role in the apomixis. And the next is the polycom group. It is the protein are involved in epigenetic regulation and may influence apomixis. And other gene is AP2 and ARF transcription factor. So are associated with seed development and could be involved in apomixis. So then I have designed the gene construction for this. So I have uh, in more detail uh, I analyzed this uh, gene responsible and found it, it uh, irresponsible in the or expressed in uh, embryo sac of maize. So it is the promoter. I use this promoter and then I make some uh, gene construct promoter with ZMS4 and gene BBM1. It is, uh, uh, I get this gene from uh, Kim. Uh, BBM1 is expressed in the as uh, you can look here that ORF baby boom or BBM1 it is ectopic expression of BBM induced somatic embryo formation in Arabidopsis and Brassica. So the idea was how to promote the independent uh, somatic embryo in maize. So this construct and then I transfer it to the uh, with particle bombardment, I use the uh, scotellum of maize and then get the embryo in the Murasic and Skook medium and bombarded this uh, Kali with the construct or gene. And after that, growing up and I uh, check with uh, some analysis uh, to check the transgenic with southern blood, northern blood, and western blood. So as the result, so that uh, there is several combination. And I make a magnification of this kernel. So several uh, crossing and the result of this experience showed that in the F, A188 cross with H99 and um, inserted with a, a promoter and the gene construct showed this uh, result, the yield, it is uh, more than 17% seven, uh, is increased than the normal plan. So I use a confocal laser scanning microscope to check out the, in more detail the expression of this gene. So we can show you that uh, there is some uh, cell grow up in the inside of uh, embryo sac. So in the next slide, I show you that's in more detail. There's here the structure with the confocal laser mic uh, scanning micros. We can uh, look detail the um, tissues and uh, what happened in the synergate, egg cell, and also antipodal and uh, central cell. So more clear uh, uh, 
picture, we can look here that the some uh, tissues and this is can be the uh, can be cause the yield is increased because inside of the embryo sac we can found the uh, collection of cell inside. But uh, we can look here that embryo still not can be induced, cannot be induced, yeah, in this uh, embryo cell. So that's mean. That's mean we have uh, we look and hear that uh, the embryo can be not uh, uh, stimulated yet. So that's my, uh, that's why we have to calculate again or choose another uh, gene like a baby boom in the from uh, orange sativa or rice, and also from rice also U W C and also another gene. And the important maybe we have to apply uh, uh, gene editing to complete the system. So there is some uh, gene, uh, some gene candidate that uh, we can uh, use this and in, in the next uh, research to uh, make that the apomexis can happen. So as Concluding remarks with the genetic engineering of amoxis plan make it possible. And second, genes related to embryo sac development are increasingly being isolated and analyzed in more detail. And collaboration and resource sharing for biotechnology approach in plant breeding will encourage the creation of new super varieties to meet food security and uh, suitability. So I would say thank you to all our team and uh, research team from Regensburg University, Hamburg University, Wageningen University, Kim, Botelier and um, team and Minister of Education, Culture, Research and Technology, Indonesia, University of Jajaran and research team. Thank you. Thank you very much, Professor Suseno, for your great presentation. And I think today we really learned about how the idea of the food security in the future is very, very important for us. And because we know that there are many issues of world hunger in many parts of the world, and hopefully this kind of approach can become an alternative solution for that. And hopefully, as you said in the last statement, that uh, this kind of conference can trigger the collaboration for many departments and countries around the world. And now uh, for participants, if you have any question, uh, just put it in the chat box for now, because uh, now we will move on to our uh, second speaker, Dr. Bilal. Are you ready? Okay, the time is yours. Thank you. Sure, I am ready. Okay, the time is yours. Thank you. Thank you so much for your kind presentation and the that event. I will share my screen and start for the presentation. I just would like to be sure, is there any problem about the voice or? We can hear your voice clearly and now uh, the screen is sharing. Okay. We can see your screen now. Thanks so much. I'm Bilal from Turkey and now in Istanbul it's about 5.30 a.m. So I'm sorry if any unexpected problem occurs. Thanks so much for the invitation and I'm happy to participate the conference. Before starting, I would like to briefly introduce myself. I'm uh, my bachelor, master and the PhD from chemical engineering department, and, but I just interested some bioprocesses and up to now I had some distinct researcher experiences. First one is in Malaysia where I met, met the Professor Fabry and I would like to thank you him for that conference again. And the rest of them is Japan, Finland, Norway and the Sweden. Now I'm working and in Turkey, Yildiz Technical University as a research associate and the lecturer. 
My research interest is mainly industrial microbiology, biofuel and the biochemical production, food visualization, process simulation, and the techno-economic evaluation. Since I'm a chemical engineer, I just would like to work on the, how I can combine both bioprocesses and the chemical engineering approach. Today, my content presentation is the research motivation, carbon emissions, and the carbon neutrality goals. Some key concepts for the carbon peak, what are the carbon neutrality, what types of precautions should be taken, what are the biorefineries, and one case study, and then finally conclusion. Our research motivation for the carbon neutrality and the biorefineries is mainly for the climate change and the greenhouse gas emission. What are the current studies in the our Earth? So we are expecting the more warmer Earth by the reaching 2100. So there are so many things we need to consider about the economic development, social economic growth, or the energy security, both of them environmental concern also will result in the human health improvement. As the professor mentioned that the sustainable development goals by the United Nations, these are the urgent calls for the developing or developed countries. My presentation will be mainly on the affordable clean energy, climate action, and the sustainability. So, of course, these all 17 goals are greatly important for our Earth. Carbon cycle, when we compare about the fossil fuel and the biofuels, you can see here short-term balanced carbon cycle when we use the biofuels and the long-term we can say unbalanced because it will take a couple of million years for the balancing the carbon cycle for the fossil fuel. Therefore, biofuel is greatly important and the other environmental concern is the reducing greenhouse gas emission. For In order to reducing that gases, it needs some combination of the efforts. One of them is decreasing the energy demand the other is increasing the energy efficiency and use electrification and finally increasing renewable energy share. So what is the carbon neutrality? Carbon neutrality concept is the combination or the consist of two different concepts. First one is the emission reduction target. The gas emission should be reduced up to 60 or 80 percent and rest of the 20 and the 40 percent can be replaced through the sustainable development initiatives. The most important part here is the greenhouse gas minimization is required in order to maintain the mean temperature increase by 2100 at a controllable level of about 1.5 to centigrade degree. There is there are another important notion about the, that topic based on the world consensus or the in, intergovernmental panel on climate change, IPCC. Carbon peak can be defined as the maximum point of the carbon emission. So carbon dioxide emission now can consider the stop growing and begin to decline. And the carbon neutrality is the balance between the emission and the removals over a specific period. So this is the main goal for our studies and our Earth. Unfortunately, in the upcoming graphs, we will see that we didn't reach the carbon peak yet. This is the atmospheric carbon dioxide and the carbon dioxide emissions here on the left hand side of the y axis. We can see the ppm at the carbon dioxide concentration in the atmosphere starting from the 18th century. And we can notice that the industrial, after the industrial revolution, um, atmospheric carbon dioxide concentration start to increase and it drastically increased. Now, here the left hand side gray color is the CO2 emission. We can notice that the, about 35 gigatons annually carbon dioxide is emitted, but this is from 2020 and now it's approximately 50 gigatons per year. This is the cumulative CO2 emissions 
you can see the United States is the highest point here and the China unfortunately slope is greater than the United States maybe due to the population or the high industrial power these are the cumulative CO2 emission and the rest of the parameters the rest of the countries are the European Union which consists of the now 27 countries this is annual CO2 emissions by region you can see the highest emission comes from the China at the latest year and the United States comes here and Asia excluding China and India and here you can see the Europe rest of the parameters this, that graph is quite important what we can expect in the upcoming years greenhouse gas emissions greenhouse gas emissions and the warming scenarios now we are here now and uh, if we can continue about the current policies we can notice that the about three centigrade degree uh, warmer earth in the 2100 but this is the target place and the target if it's all achieved we will see that about two centigrade degree increment in the our temperature this is the case for the no climate policies and what are the biorefineries why we are needing that as we discussed the biofuels are environmental friendly and in order to replace the fossil fuel we need some biorefiners or more complex facilities for the biomass utilization or efficient product food or energy vector production it's the types of next step towards upgrading biomass utilization uh, in order to eliminate the limits of the potential use of such resources it's directly related to critical uh, sustainable development goals you can see the particular for the seven affordable and the clean energy industry innovation and the responsible consumption and production finally and of course climate action here there are several concepts and narrative in the literature about the biorefining it's the main idea is the similar thing of the petrochemical refinery uh, maximizing the valuable product result from the petroleum material processing but that case the feedstock is the green biomass and uh, it's the cascade or the holistic approach in order to produce multiple products biorefinery as we said that is a types of environmental friendly process and the biofuels heat and electricity or biomaterials could be produced it's crucial for the environmental sustainability and the circular economy because we are aware that the fossil fuel is relatively cheaper than the bioprocesses so in order to make more profitable there should be some other product it must be produced simultaneously this is the network analysis for the biorefineries carbon neutrality and the processes how the key concept are interacting each other you can see the on the center part biofuel carbon dioxide defining and the biomass can be listed there is a one case study this is a collaboration work with the Stavanger University which is in Norway it's not complicated yet but I will tell about how we are trying to find some solution ourselves for the utilization of the spent coffee grounds spent coffee grounds and uh, residue of the coffee industry and the coffee as we know the second highest consumed dairy in the world and Norway is the second place after Finland with about 8.8 .8 kilogram per capita so there are several approach could be adopted that process utilizing the spent coffee ground in our cases we are focusing mostly on aerobic digestion on aerobic digestion you can see from the sketch brief sketch of the pathway it consists of the four different stages hydrolysis acetogenesis acetogenesis and the methanogenesis so 
as a, a final of the that process, volatile fatty acid are produced as a biochemicals, methane as a biofuel, and the residue rest of the digest that could be used as a fertilizer. Which, uh, based on the focus product, the stage could be stopped by inhibiting like the methanogenesis cultures if you inhibit them you can finish the first three stage uh, in our study we focused on the two different scenario in order to compare the as a economic efficiency or the product ranges first scenario is the combination of the dark fermentation and the photo fermentation the second scenario is the dark fermentation and anaerobic digestion Mostly experimental data are used and some of the missing are utilized from the literature. For the dark fermentation, I can start from the anaerobic type. No, dark fermentation, I'm sorry for that. Dark fermentation is the first two stage of the anaerobic digestion process. So organic materials converted into volatile fat acid and hydrogen and the photo fermentation volatile fat acid could be converted into hydrogen and anaerobic digestion used for the volatile fatty acid conversion to methane so overall in the first scenario we can say that our product is hydrogen in the second scenario is the hydrogen plus methane in the literature it causes a bioheating these are the stoichiometric reaction, potential reaction for the chemical pretreatment, dark fermentation, anaerobic digestion, and the photo fermentation. These are all adapted to the softwares called SuperPro Designer for the process simulation and the economic analysis. Firstly, we can start with the process simulation. This is the first scenario. In order to see more clearly, we can focus on the first part. This is the spent copy ground. It consists of the 55% moisture. This is one of the cons of our process because it requires more heating uh, process and uh, higher energy requirement. So using more dry or higher content of the carbon sources will be more efficient about the dead sources. It in, comes to plant and uh, some physical pretreatment after chemical pretreatment and the enzymatic hydrolysis. The upper part was sent. We will discuss in the conclusion section. There are some other approach for the reaching maybe complete biorefinery. Now on that study, we used the lignin particles for the steam generation. Then the higher pressure, high pressure steam used for the electricity production and the low pressure steam these electricity and the low pressure steam used entire plant in order to reduce the operational expenses and finally sugar fermentable sugar sent for the dark fermentation and this is the gas phase our first gas and the rest of the volatile fatty acid sent to the photo fermentation this is the light source uh, model for the lighting 12 hours per day and finally our products are the hydrogen here as the second scenario upper part is totally same but the lower part is the dark fermentation and the anaerobic digestion as you see here our products are the biohydrogen and the methane so we can start for the economic evaluation economic evaluation capital expenses and operational expenses are the crucial parameters here and the capital expenses we can consider about the direct fixed cost it consists of the total plant direct cost total plant indirect cost and the contingency and the contractor fee here these uh, each parameter consists of the purchase cost installation process piping instrumentation insulation etc it goes so on these parameter can be obtained from the chemical engineering design parameters or the studies from the literature these are the scenario and the, our capital cost estimation here these are the operational expenses operational expenses of the process consist of the heating and the cooling there are some 
different agents for the heating and the cooling and of course electricity but in order to make it more profitable to contribute the circular economy or make more profitable compared to fossil fuel we adopt some saving strategies which comes from the power generation and the steam production and finally heat integration which is the excess amount residual heat could be used in another equipment in the entire process so this is the total operational expenses and this is the net operational expenses when we consider about the saving as a conclusion higher moisture content of the spent coffee ground result in the higher heating cost and the final product capacity because about 55 percent was the moisture and the lower cellulose content capital cost of the dark fermentation on iron digestion is 10 percent higher than the dark fermentation photo fermentation process roughly 30 percent reduction can be achieved via saving strategies and the carbon dioxide utilization for environmental concern and the revenue concern is crucial carbon dioxide could be used for the chemical industry and the residues from digestion and the fermentation could be used for the fertilizer. What are the future work? In order to complete the complete, in order to complete the biorefinery process, we are working on the genetic modification of the cultures for converting lignin into PTC, which is the precursor of the bioplastic. So for that case, you can remember about the lignin in our current study was burned for the generating electricity and the low pressure steam. But in the upcoming studies, we are expecting to have the biofuels, bioplastic and the fertilizer at the same time in order to achieve the complete biorefinery and of course uncertainty and the sensitive analysis for the cash flow there are some economic concepts internal rate of return net present value and the payback period will be calculated for all scenarios which is the more efficient and the other alternative pretreatment processes will be considered thank you so much for your attention and i'm happy to participate the conference. Thank you, Dr. Bilal, for raising a very, very important theme on sustainability. I believe the idea of carbon neutrality and also climate change mitigation is now also being highlighted in Indonesia because Indonesia is also um, placing a policy for the achieving nationally determined contributions in 2030 in reducing the uh, greenhouse gas emission. And I think you also propose such a unique innovation in the spent coffee grounds utilization, because uh, as we all know that coffee is um, a cul become a part of a culture in many of countries. So I think uh, the supplies for that is uh, uh, something that we can use uh, in sustainably. Uh, but uh, we'll keep the discussion later for the Q&A section. And now Thanks so we'll much. I'm ready for that. You're welcome. And we'll now move on to the third speaker, uh, Dr. Wan. Can you hear us? Yes, I'm sharing my screen now. Okay, thank you. Uh, so the time is yours. Can you see my screen? Yes, doctor. All right. Okay, thank you to Dr. Kevin, uh, Professor Susano, and Dr. Bilal. Uh, uh, great presentation. And um, um, I'll start my presentation on the uh, mushroom technology. Um, thank you to uh, Dr. Fabrodoni for inviting me. Um, I was told that I have only 15 minutes to give my talk. Uh, but I do have 40 slides, but I'll keep it really simple. Okay, um, a little bit about myself. Um, I was graduated as a microbiologist, uh, food biotechnologist, and a PhD in fermentation, uh, fermentation technology. 
some kind uh, some membership with uh, AIT Island Young Scientist Network Technology Society United Kingdom and uh, National Food Technologies US uh, a little bit of uh, about my university uh, University of Malaya uh, it is actually started as a King Edward University Singapore uh, then turns to Raffles College Singapore Raffles College University of Malaya and turns to University of Malaya uh, some profiles uh, University is increasing well uh, last year uh, also this year and towards 2014 and uh, it is now the the first and the top university in Malaysia we receive some stars and uh, good uh, visibility among uh, South Asia countries and uh, at the moment we are number three uh, in South Asia and uh, 65 in Asia Okay, uh, this is uh, our annual performance in 2022. All right, so this is actually what I'm going to talk about. Uh, so Professor Seno focused on uh, SDG 2, Zero Hunger, Dr. Bilal on uh, SDG 6, isn't it? SDG, if I'm not mistaken. So I'm actually trying to utilize the food waste and focusing on the fungi activity which can turn the fungi into gold and also to planetary health. This is actually what I'm doing now uh, for my research. And this is actually the policy that I like to share uh, among peers here. This is actually the Malaysian policy in terms of biotechnology. Uh, the first policy is actually uh, this is National Biotechnology Policy of Malaysia. Number one is actually for food biotechnology and food security. This is our, num our number one priority, uh, our healthcare, and number three is industrial biotechnology. And this is actually the problem, uh, the current world problem. Uh, we have three major problems, actually. We have food, water, and energy. And we have 17 goals need to be solved. It's a lot actually. How to solve 17? At the moment, we cannot solve probably five yet. So to solve 17, I'm not sure, probably 17 years. But however, we like to focus on three important things, which is food, water, and energy. And if you read the, the verse Roman, this is actually due to human. Okay, Human corrupted the land and caused this problem. Uh, in terms of context, this is example in Malaysia. Food waste contributes a lot in terms of domestic waste, daily food waste, and this waste can actually fit seven Olympic swimming pools. Can you imagine? The average Malaysian throws away 1.64 kilos of waste daily compared to the worldwide average 1.2 and the waste production increased 65 tons a day, day by day, day by day. And we have to do something on this. It is such a waste if you keep producing food, but we also keep wasting food. So the ratio of producing and wasting, wasting is higher. So we're not going anywhere. And this is actually an example of uh, food waste, demographic in terms of gender, male and female, you can clearly see that the number one wastage is actually unfinished bought food, okay? We realize that we buy food that we don't need, okay? If we go to the market, we should buy only one loaf of bread, but instead, if, we, if they have sales discount, we tend to buy more. So this contributes a lot to unfinished bought food. We don't need it. Same goes to unfinished cooked food. We like to cook extra food. Imagine a household with... Hello, sorry. Yes, no problem, doctor. You can continue. Okay, sorry. Okay, can you hear me? Yes, we hear yes. you. Please All right, go okay. Ahead. Sorry, technical glitch. So there are steps to reduce this food wastage. Uh, wastage. When shopping, 
only buying food that you don't need. Uh, sorry, only buying food that you do need. Okay, and don't eat the foods. Don't don't cook too much. Excuse me, doctor. These are the ways. Screen again. Oh, my bad. Sorry. Everything is clear now. You can continue. Thank you. Okay. All right. Sorry for the technical glitch. So uh, there are clearly steps to reduce this problem. You go to shopping, only buy food that you need, only store food that you need, only use food that you need, only store food that is uh, required by your household, donate food, and do not, do not cook too much. Okay? So the problem of uh, the problem of food biotechnologies like me, it's no point of me producing food, keep producing food if the waste is too high. So we are now trying to convert the waste to food instead of producing more food. If you look at here, self sufficiency ratio, uh, you can see the production of food in Malaysia. Which one is important? Uh, especially number one is from sugarcane, papaya, and so on. And we eat a lot of mutton and so on. So uh, we try to actually improve our food security year by year. And three out of 10 of nation feel that they do not have enough money to buy food. Three out of 10 is quite low percentage at the moment. So comes to COVID-17, I tried to solve all, but I will be focus on some of the um, area, which is food, uh, energy, okay? So this is actually my published article uh, last year. Sorry, this year. And you can see that there are three ways that can be utilized as food. First is mushroom, peanut waste, third is uh, soybean waste. Okay? From mushroom, you can utilize the fruiting body, the uh, the base, the back, and turn it to food. For peanut, you can use the shell, the skin, also to turn it to food. For soybean, you can use the okara, you can use the hull, also to turn it to food. Okay. So this is actually an example of my work. Uh, I work closely with the uh, mushroom farm. So if you notice that, if you do buy mushroom, they only sell the top part, okay? So out of 300 gram of harvested mushroom, okay, 100 gram is basically discarded. 50 gram is spoiled, 50 gram is, considered, is named as fruiting body base, the bottom part. Industries, they never sell this bottom part because it looks ugly. Consumer won't buy them. However, the food, the protein content is very high. Okay. Actually, the bottom part contains higher protein content compared to the top part, but it has been discarded because of the looks. Okay. It is actually food. And I turn it to flour. So this is a simple food waste conversion. You identify the high protein waste and you turn it to flour. It's a very simple step. You take the waste, you dry it, you powder it, and turn it to flour. So you can actually play around with this flour. And I call this flour as mushroom agro waste flour, M-A-W-F. So my first uh, trial was actually to use this flour to make cookies. And it shows different acceptance by consumer. Uh, as you know that mushroom contains umami, so the product is not suitable to be used as a dessert, okay? non-savory. And I also tried as bun. And I noticed that consumer don't really like this, but it is still edible. 
However, when I turn it to burger, the acceptance is really high. So I noticed that consumer loves this product. So this product is basically 100% from waste. Okay. I turn this uh, mushroom waste into burger. So this can also answers SDG number 12, which is responsible consumption and production. If you go to all mushroom farm, 95% of mushroom farm, they discarded this waste and they only feed it as to the cows, turn it to fertilizers. This is basically an important high protein food source. And most of them just discard it just like that. And you can see that the fish basically getting bigger and healthier with this product. So in other way, I basically managed to touch SDG 14, life below water and SDG 2, zero hunger. For the next one, I use my shroom as food dyes. You should notice that there are lots of food in the world use artificial dyes, and this is not really good. So, how to solve this problem? Obviously, I'm a mushroom peep, a mushroom person. I look at red, yellow, blue mushroom. I turn it to dyes, and uh, we manage to produce bread, colored bread from these dyes. Okay, so nutritious, it's safe, and it can help with food security. These are my team that uh, we presented the idea of uh, trying to feed the world by 2050. This is in Marrakesh, Morocco. And how can we actually solve this uh, world hunger okay, by 2050? And uh, in 2022, we noticed that the idea of feeding the world by 2050 is very hard to achieve. We'll probably need another 10 years to do that because of COVID-19. So this is some of my initiative for SDG to zero hunger. I do have a specific class in University of Malaya whereby I teach students how to make food by themselves. This can basically stimulate their sense of skill in terms of food production, food security, and their survivability in this challenging world. So I taught them how to make tempeh from scratch. Okay, In other way, they can sell their own tempeh. Okay? I do teach my students how to make soy sauce from scratch. Okay, Very simple step. Some of it, I taught my student how to make kimchi. All right. So uh, implementing food biotechnology or food security, I noticed that I have to transfer the knowledge to students. And then, then the student will actually appreciate the technology. Another aspect of mushroom technology that I've basically try is actually white biotechnology. If you notice that currently they have four types of biotechnology, blue, red, white, and green. Okay. The red is actually more on health, medical, diagnostic, white, gene-based bioindustries, blue, aquaculture, coastal, marine, and green is more on agricultural, environmental, and biotechnology. If you talk, uh, if you touch on why fungal biotechnology is basically playing around with fungi to do multiple industrial problems, such as to use fungi as textile in paper industry, as a biocontrol agent, as a bioremediation agent, as a biofuel, as an enzyme, so on. I would like to share some of my discoveries on this matter. So I use fungi to clean water. If you look closely, this is actually a bit in 
The color looks exactly like a Pepsi or a Coca-Cola. Okay. It's really dirty. And I use mushroom to basically clean the water. So it is natural. And I managed to solve SDG6, clean water and sanitation. Not just Pepsi. By this technology, you can play around with the bioactive compound from it, okay? You can produce antibiotics, you can produce cream, antiviral, antifungal cream, so on. So this can actually help in uh, SDG number three, good health and well-being. If you look on the left, the video shows how I produce antibiotics from scratch. Really easy, okay? So this is actually another, my discovery uh, last year. I managed to extract oil from the mushroom, okay? Not much, but it's still something. And we managed to uh, convert the lipid to biodiesel, okay? So lots of people didn't actually believe what I did, but I managed to did it, okay? So we managed to produce a biodiesel for mushrooms and we call it Ganu Diesel. And we are at the prototype stage to use this technology for cars, hopefully as affordable and clean energy. Not just that, uh, I play around with this technology. So see all those dyes that I extracted from the red, the pink, the blue mushrooms, it's not just for the food purposes. You can also use it as a solar cells, okay? If you notice that in the solar cells industries, they use chemically produced graphene to absorb energy from the sun. It is unsustainable. But mushroom, they have a specific pigment that can also absorb this energy. So you just have to extract them and put in the solar panels. So easily we can solve SDG 13 climate action, okay? So another technology, this is actually very popular in Indonesia, okay? I forgot the company, but it is really popular in Indonesia. They use mushroom as building blocks, okay? Replacing industrial bricks, which is not really environmentally friendly, okay? So this mushroom brick is buoyant, is fireproof, is punch-proof. Okay, uh, this could be a future technology in construction. Okay, which also answers sustainability development goals number nine in terms of industry innovation and infrastructure. Infrastructure. Well, not just that. My friend in Hamburg. They actually play around with mushroom as soil conditioner. Okay. We noticed that to improve the soil health, you do a, a chemical treatment or you burn the land. All of these are not really good for soil uh, conditioning. So the most the easiest and the most environmentally safe is actually use mushroom. Okay. Which answers. SDG number 15, life on land. So the idea is actually to bind all of this. Okay. SDG 12, sorry, SDG 17 is actually to straighten the means of implementation. I've noticed that. Uh, technically, I've managed to solve have, uh, all 17 goals by mushrooms, okay? Mushroom is actually an SDG binder. If you notice that I managed to solve all SDG goals, including 17, by mushroom, because mushroom link from, even from Universitas Pajajaran to University Malaya to German to Middle East, okay? It is connected in our soil, in our core earth, okay? And it, it is the longest 
creature created by God to clean our earth. So my idea or my philosophy is actually I am not afraid of failure. If I have an idea, I just do it and grow from it. Okay. So that's why I have lots of uh, crazy ideas. So uh, if you have problems in research, look at the sky. The sky is beautiful and it has no cracks. So that's all from me. Thank you. Thank you very much, Dr. Wan, for your wonderful presentation. I'm really touched when you introduced about the Romans first at the first, because it was mentioned that human caused destruction. And we know that there is the issue of food waste, but that the contrast, there is also the issue of uh, hunger as well. So uh, this is a very interesting presentation from you that you have shown that for only from one mushroom, there are so many benefits that we can extract it for and also uh, in triggers the potential collaboration from all around the world in the future. So again, uh, thank you for your presentation. Now we will thank move you. on to the Q&A section and we have several questions that I will uh, represent and ask it to each of the presenters. Uh, the first one, question from Sunny Hafido. And this question is raised for Professor Suseno. Dear Professor Suseno, I would like to ask about what is the main benefit of apomixis in crop compared to selfing or cross-pollination when the grain forming, filling until harvest, and conventional crop or seed that used by the farmer, it is widely used, the F1 hybrid seed, with to limit farmers creating their own homozygote and make dependency to seed producer. Is it when the apoc mix is used, farmers can easily produce and maintain their own homozygote line without always buying the seed from produce? Okay, thank you. The <coughs> good question with this uh, <coughs> apomixis and compared to others uh, uh, typical plants. So the apomixis as shown in the slide that um, we can get the plant in the component and a yield it is uh, more stable. That means the result is always uh, from F2 generation, F3 and etc. is will be fixed. And the characterize characterize of the apomixis is the uh, the same genetic identity with the female plants. But if you have a hybrid plant, that hybrid plant of F1 plants, it is the on on the uh, germ line or the parental female and male so that's mean you have to provide a plan in the first uh, is the parent is hacked with superior uh, characters for instance for female it is uh, good for yield and uh, male it is uh, good for uh, disease resistant so you make a crossing to the parental and you get a F1. That what F1 is a heterozygote. And you, if you put the, and take the seed from harvesting first uh, generation and put in the uh, planting in the field, you can get a diverse or yield is fluctuated. So you uh, cannot guarantee that the component and the yield it is the same as uh, as you have uh, from F1. So, but uh, compared to apomixis, you have a fixed uh, yield. So how about the next generation for the farmer? Of course, the one tools can be applied that we can propagate the apomixis plant by vegetatively propagation. 
So I think like uh, 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 solanum tuberosum, it is can you uh, use propagation with the shoot and then get the seed. So it is more easy than uh, to the company to buy seeds. So that means we have to really calculate it the efficiency of the apomixis and can be applied in the farmers. Thank you. Thank you, Professor, for your answer. Now uh, we have another question in the chat box. Uh, the next question was raised to Professor Wan, and this question is from Siti Nurmila. I would like to ask Professor Wan, in the use of food waste, we are often concerned about the feasibility of using it as food due to pathogen contamination, especially due to poor waste handling. Do you have certain procedures to ensure that food products from waste are safe for consumption? Could you give an example of handling soybean skin waste? Thank you. Okay, thank you, Dr. Kevin. Thank you, CT, for the question. Okay, I'll give you an example. Uh, in Malaysia, we have a company that basically utilizes human, real human food waste to produce um, food for dogs and cats. Okay, so to be exact, if you go to any pet food, they, they call it pro diet, something like that, and also food for human. So, number one rule for food waste. Uh, Obviously, pathogen is number one. Uh, I give you an example. Soybean skin. It is it's like, uh, I would say, a party for fungi. Okay? Fungi will love that. So, number one, if you want to do uh, waste extraction, make sure you have to dry it first. You have to dry. Never let it. Uh, soak, never let it uh, with uh, in water form because water attracts bacteria. Always straight away dry it and apply septic technique. Uh, if you are trying to play around with wings, such as uh, mushrooms, okay, they also have a toxin called mycotoxin. So you have to choose wisely. Uh, if you're unsure of the whether the wings has toxin or not, the famous is, is uh, the famous toxin is called mycotoxin, which is toxin from uh, fungi. You can do fermentation. Okay, fermentation will get rid of all of that. Okay. Okay. Thank you, Doctor Wan. Uh, now we have the last question from Puji, and this is for Doctor Bilal. I want to ask to Dr. Bilal, we think it's crucial to find emerging single step technologies and advanced biotechnological tools to become cost competitive against fossil fuels. In your perspective, what should we do first to overcome that problem? Second, since the most available feedstock in nature is in mixed biomass, what can we do to achieve the same product with that feedstock? Then we use a single type of biomass. Thank you. Uh, thanks so much for the question. And actually, maybe I missed, I was looking for the chat box. I couldn't see the question. But as I understand from the question, it's the late to how we can make it more feasible or how about the, if we have a mixture how we can utilize it am i correct yes okay yeah it's totally right because the main idea is the performance of the microorganism depends on the media or the feedstock each of them is a critical for the overall production but the, as we know from the fossil fuel it's quite cheaper it depends on the of course the 
world situation like the COVID or if there is some war, the prices fluctuated, but all the cases is the biological process is maybe more sensitive or more fragile. We cannot directly reach the fossil fuel prices. For that reason, in the presentation, I try to mention about the, if one product or one feedstock, each single molecules could be converted some of the other valuable product maybe the profitability or the economic concern could be solved because all the cases all of us mainly focused on the cellulose and the hemicellulose we try to convert for by the acid pretreatment or deprotective solvent ionic liquids so there are so many methods for converting into the fermentable sugar, but all of them can bring some challenges or can bring some additional cost. The idea is using most cheaper one and most efficient one and converting all of them. The lignin is several studies are starting to use the lignin. There are some activities for the genetic modification of the culture. We know that the pathways of the some processes can produce some byproducts and uh, for that case purification will give you more additional cost for the genetic modification if you somehow modify your pathway in order to funnel your main target product one of them is the pvc is the precursor of the bioplastic and when we consider that we didn't complete the studies yet but the if we convert lignin into bioplastic cellulose, hemicellulose to biofuels and the biochemicals and the residue is the digester for the fertilizer, it might be uh, just the approach. I couldn't be sure if it is useful totally or not, but I'm the only thing I know is we have still more way as a globally to make more feasible bioprocesses. Thank you, Dr. Bilal. And now we have come to the end of this plenary session. Once again, I would like to offer my gratitude to Professor Suseno and also Dr. Bilal and also Dr. Wan. Thank you very much Thanks. for coming and sharing your insights. Hopefully everyone here can enjoy today's quick plenary session and I hope all of us can gain insights for our next research as well. Thank you very much and please give a big round of applause to all of our speakers today. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Kevin Muhammad Lukman, PhD, for your great moderation. And not forget to our three speakers for providing us new insights and knowledge. As we come to the close of our virtual international conference, we have a special announcement to make. We will be recognizing the best presentations of the conference. This, this is, is the time, time we, we are, are waiting for. for. There will be three best of presentation with one of them being best of the best. Congratulations to Muhammad Ihsan, Pauline Desti Nugraini, and Devi Maulida. And for the best of the best speakers, congratulations to 
Pauline Desti Nugraini. Please give applause for all of the, the best speakers. Congratulations for all the best speakers for their outstanding presentations. Your hard work and dedications to excellence have truly stood out. To all participants, the next agenda is closing remarks from Mr. Yudi Andriana, MSc, PhD, as Vice Dean of Faculty of Mathematics and Natural Science, Universitas Pajajaran. For Mr. Yudi, the floor is yours. The Honorable, the Dean of Graduate School, the Honorable, the Head of Master of Biology, Faculty of Mathematics and Natural Sciences, Universitas Pajajaran, the Honorable, all lecturers, professors, participants, on behalf of the Faculty of Mathematics and Natural Sciences, Universitas Pajajaran, we would like to thanks, thank you very much to all keynote speakers, invited speakers, for your willingness to come here, not only coming, but also to share with us here about your very valuable knowledge, valuable experiences. One of key performance indicators of our university, especially our faculty, Faculty of Mathematics and Natural Sciences, Universitas Pajajaran, is the number of journals which have a good, very, uh, very good reputation. So then I think this kind of activity may improve, may develop the uh, knowledge, the experience of our staff, not only our staff, but also our students such that we can develop, uh, make uh, or create our research uh, atmosphere and also it can change to be not only research uh, atmosphere but also we can develop to be uh, academic atmosphere. For example, we met here now but then we can develop not only doing research collaboration but also we can develop to be academic collaboration such that, uh, such, such, such that doing team teaching and we can also develop from uh, team teaching to uh, join course program, which means we pick one course. That course is uh, delivered by two professors, two lecturers coming from both institu institutions, for example, UNPAD and our partner institutions. And also not only involving the lecturer, but also involving the student. The student coming from both institutions ca uh, can be uh, registered in uh, these two institutions. So then uh, I think this kind of activity is very much very important and it is very good for us. Uh, it will uh, give very good effect, not only on one key performance indic uh, indicators, but also some other performance indicators of our faculty. In this occasion also, we would like to send our, the regard from our dean. Unfortunately, he is not able to attend uh, to close this uh, ceremony, this conference, because in the same time, we have another activities. And I think on behalf of the faculty, in the name of our faculty, we officially close this very nice conference by saying together Alhamdulillah, Alhamdulillah Amin. Thank you very much for joining this conference, for coming to this conference and stay healthy. And Assalamualaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh. Waalaikumsalam warahmatullahi wabarakatuh. Thank you for Mr. Yudi Andriana, Master of Science, PhD, for his time to close this event. Ladies and gentlemen, as our events come to an end, 
I would like to extend my gratitude to all of you for your participation and engagement. My name is Aji Sabutara and my partner. Youngest. It has been a privilege to be a master of ceremonies today. We have shared valuable and created meaningful connections over the course of this conference. I would like to thank our esteemed speakers for their invaluable contributions and our participants for their active involvement. A special acknowledgement goes to our organizing committee, technical team, and sponsors from Yayasan Dharma Zatiabudi, PT Elokarsa Utama, and PT Sawita Interprakasa for ensuring a smooth and successful event. As we conclude, let us carry the knowledge and connections we have gained into our future endeavors. Thank you once again for being a part of this conference. We look forward to your participation in our future events. Stay safe, stay connected, and continue to excel in your respective fields. Goodbye, Goodbye and, and have, have a wonderful, wonderful day. day. Thank you. Thank you.